So uh, it's a, a six-day program that Paul and I are going to do that is going to uh, cover the peninsula and then also cover the seven days. Um, uh, it is a program that is going to be, I think you're going to find is, is interesting. Those of you who are listening to Paul and I just um, uh, talking a little bit about the, the structure of this particular program, we've gone back and forth several times before this on um, exactly how we want to uh, present the program. And uh, we've still got a few things that we want to, uh, to sort, but by and large, I think um, uh, Paul and I are in pretty much agreement as to how we're going to approach and present this program. Uh, and I think uh, for those of you who have not seriously considered uh, this operation from uh, late March of 1862, through the uh, first week of uh, July of 1862, I think you're going to find uh, that you're in for a real treat because it is a, a real look into the early strategy of the war. You're going to see uh, things about um, uh, the interface of the political um, structure, the presidents of both uh, 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 countries and their, um, their senior leadership and how, the, how they interface and how the uh, how the uh, politicians want to see this particular war prosecuted and how the uh, commanding generals of the armies, uh, George McClellan, uh, uh, Joseph E. Johnston, uh, John Bankhead Magruder for some period, and um, uh, Robert E. Lee all interface with that. So it's a, it's a really wide ranging program that I think you're going you're gonna to find is, is really fascinating. Um, as uh, we have done in for the last year or so, um, uh, we are recording this uh, presentation and we'll link it to the registration form for the program, which will go up uh, by this weekend. And uh, uh, we welcome your uh, participation in this. Uh, if you uh, see people or there's some people that perhaps you want to uh, invite to this, uh, Karen has thrown up on the screen our uh, free YouTube channel. We have well over um, 300 subscribers, I believe here. And so consequently, uh, not only can you see uh, this presentation, but you can look at uh, some 30 other presentations that go back over, uh, over a year. Um, if you particularly like a lot of the things that uh, we're doing and you like uh, to get civil war in your, in your den, uh, you can also go to our website, and if you are a, a manager or a, a member of the Blue and Gray, uh, you can um, uh, go look at some 350 lectures that uh, we have put online from 1994 through about uh, 2004. Um, uh, Karen is showing the spot on the uh, website there, um, and we have found that that has... Um, uh, been very, very popular with people, and uh, it is available to people who are active members of the Blue and Gray Education Society. So if you are uh, and you're not uh, subscribed to this, uh, get a hold of me, and I'll make sure that you get subscribed. And if you are not a member, uh, you can join up on the site, uh, your membership of $75 a year, which is tax deductible, uh, gets you access to the site for uh, a year's time. So uh, we certainly welcome you to do that. Um, also, I'd like you to um, uh, be aware um, uh, that our hostess for the evening, Karen Needles, is the, um, uh, the uh, uh, architect and the uh, presenter of the Lincoln Archives uh, digitization project, which you're looking at on the screen right now. Um, uh, Karen has been doing this for well over 20 years. There is a ton of good um, uh, information out there uh, on any number of things. For example, some of you may remember the, um, uh, the Dakota Indian Wars of 1862 and the largest mass execution of, um, of uh, uh, people in the United States, 39 at uh, one time. Uh, all of the records, all the court martial trials and so forth of that 
are present on this site. Uh, they're available for you to look at for free. Now, <clears throat> and if you haven't seen the site, I strongly encourage you to go look at that. You'll see scans of the original documents and um, uh, you will find an endless amount of fascination going through those as I do when I go in there and so forth. The um, most important thing I want to add to this right now, and it, and it comes from this, and I just want to, want to say it um, uh, straightforward and, and uh, candidly, um, Karen has done extremely important work here and continues to do important work. Uh, all of this is free to the public. You don't have to pay a subscription or any of this other stuff to it. Uh, but uh, after 20 some odd years, um, just the stuff of keeping it online, the software has changed. It's a different digitization and so forth. She has got to raise something in the vicinity of close to $20,000 in the next um, five or six months or so to, uh, to make the conversion and keep this site live and active. So um, it is a worthy project. It is not a tax deductible donation, unfortunately, because she has not um, formally incorporated, but uh, as you can see, all the work is free, available to you for nothing. Uh, if that is worth something to you, I highly encourage you to uh, to make a donation to help her make the transition. Otherwise, at some point in the future, this site just will not be supportable any longer because the software will not have been, been updated. So um, uh, I hope uh, you recognize the importance of this. It's, a, it's an important project, and I hope that you'll uh, support it. So, well, good evening, uh, Paul. Uh, uh, it's taken a while, but you and I are finally in a position where we're going to get to uh, taxi work directly uh, uh, with each other. And it's, it's something I'm really, truly looking forward to uh, ever since I found out that, um, that you were so fascinated with the, uh, with the seven days campaign. Of course, uh, my master's work was uh, involved with the Peninsula campaign and with General Magruder. And so it just seems like a marriage made in heaven. Um, so uh, uh, I'm, re I'm really looking forward to working with you. Um, and say something, Paul, because I, I, can't, I can't see you. I want to make sure you're still up with me. Yeah, 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 I'm here. Okay, I, now we got it. I, I was yeah, just I'm, I'm this. just, you know, I'm just trying to keep the bandwidth open by, uh, you know, um, keeping a low uh, uh, electronic profile. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm um, to be honest, I'm in awe of your work with the uh, Peninsula campaign and all that. And my, uh, interestingly enough, my, my first interest with the seven days was my master's work down at Air Command and Staff College, of all places, the Air Force, uh, doing a land campaign and looking at the uh, uh, Lee's operations just from a very narrow view of the nine principles of war. And so um, getting a chance to uh, roam around the battlefield with you is uh, uh, really enticing to me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, what I find uh, interesting about this, and of course, when you talk about the principles of war, and we'll get to this just in, in, a, in a little bit as we move further into tonight's discussion, um, I find myself endlessly fascinated with the, um, uh, with the mission statements. When, you know, when you read uh, Lee's report of the campaign, uh, his first line of the report is, under ordinary circumstances, the enemy army should have been destroyed. And then you take it a step further and you read the letter that, um, that Jeff Davis wrote to his wife, Verina, uh, talking about the campaign. And he says, the only thing I regret about the campaign just ended was the loss of the shipyard in Norfolk. And that, that seems to me to be a, a really good place uh, to start from because um, You've got a uh, commander in chief, Abraham Lincoln, uh, who has uh, found frustration. He's, he's elevated a 35 year old man to command of all the armies of the United States, George McClellan, 
And then he has watched McClellan spend the best part of six months organizing that army, and he can't seem to get him to move. Um, uh, what, what's your thoughts about, um, about uh, Lincoln and his, um, uh, the generation of General War Order number one? Well, I guess my, uh, my first thought is Lincoln uh, did a superb jaw, job of um, developing a uh, strategic sense for warfare as he went along, you know, uh, other than the Black Hawk War, you know, uh, uh, that's about the extent of his uh, uh, military, uh, I guess, preparation. But as he goes into the war, he, and, and it's really interesting, Landry, when you read some of the letters, especially that he wrote, uh, to McClellan and then later uh, Meade and Grant, he develops the innate sense of uh, warfare and the nature of the war as it has developed and evolved from the beginning. I mean, it, it's a very, in my view, subtle transformation where a, uh, you know, a senior um civilian leader, which is, of course, the heart of our civil military relations, um, grows in his job. And he's just got this common sense view of why don't you do this? Or may I suggest you do that? And why are you not doing this? I mean, it, 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 it's just amazing, uh, I think, how Lincoln grows. The other part of that, I think, that uh, fascinates me, especially at this time in the war, is a delineation and a transition, if you will, from a limited war with limited objectives, i.e. McClellan, to moving towards what we call today total war, which encompasses uh, not just the military but also the civilian population, the means of production, um, uh, a, a totally encompassing view of warfare that I think Lincoln came to uh, understand had to be accomplished. Um, if for no other reason that the North was compelled to aid the South. I mean, they could not not do that. And uh, as the war moved on, you know, Lincoln, I think matured and uh, I think McClellan's views of limited warfare are noble, uh, trying to uh, save his troops and get a, a solution with the minimum number of casualties and deaths and property damage. Uh, but that wasn't about to happen. And I think Lincoln, you know, made that transition uh, much quicker uh, than uh, McClellan did. And uh, it's, it, it's an interesting um, uh, morphosis of uh, how one views the uh, character of warfare as well as, I think, the uh, nature of war. So that's, that's what kind of intrigues me at this point. I mean, I think it, I hate the word. I hate the word, but everybody uses it. It's an inflection point, Ugh, inflection yeah. point in, uh, in the nature of warfare. Uh, but it, uh, it is, it really is. I mean, it, it marks a transition, I think, from the uh, limited objection, objectives of warfare uh, to a much more encompassing view of war uh, uh, from uh, um, you know, a quick war to a war of exhaustion and attrition. And um, uh, it's a very interesting period of time. If you start with the peninsula, all the way up to, uh, let's say, Malvern Hill. Yeah, you know, I think um, conversely, when I look at um, the Confederates' consideration at the start of the war, when, um, when Lee comes south in April of 61 and he becomes the political advisor, the, the commander of the uh, Virginia forces and the uh, Virginia's initial deployment of forces uh, commissions Joe Johnson. Lee is, of course, commissioned as a major general of the Virginia forces, commanding the Virginia forces. And um, uh, Joe Johnson becomes the 
ranking field officer uh, at the rank of Brigadier General in Northern Virginia, and uh, John Magruder becomes a second ranking officer or third ranking officer in Virginia, the rank of Colonel, and is placed on the uh, on the peninsula. When you study the uh, the, the manner in which Lee plans the defense of old Virginia, uh, you see a metamorphosis that's particularly uh, noticeable on the peninsula. I mean, I could, I could go over the entire area of, of war preparations, but I think the thing that most impressed me was Virginia seizes the Gosport Naval Shipyard. Uh, they cannot take, unfortunately, Fort Monroe, unfortunate for them because Monroe will be this, this pivot point of activity that goes from A to B to C to D that always has the Confederates on the tip of their toes, uh, believing that anything going on at Fort Monroe is a precursor. And three hours later, uh, military vessels with troops will be on their way up the James River or up the York River. So there's always concern about that. And the peninsula, which is nothing as it was as it is today. It was it was very very miasmic, swampy. Uh, just a few roads cut through from Hampton and Newport News up to Yorktown and to Williamsburg. Uh, then onto the Chickahominy River uh, has a lot of points that have to be defended. And uh, when the shipyard uh, is captured and the spoils of the shipyard, which are uh, naval ordnance, by and large, a lot of 24 and 32 pounders, uh, most of them without carriages, are inventoried. Uh, Lee and the Confederacy begin to distribute them all over the Confederacy, but uh, primarily in and along places like Sewell's Point and Lambert's Point in Norfolk um, and along the James and the York Rivers. Um, at Wormley Creek and places like that to cover areas where uh, amphibious forces may come behind a line and then attack. And it's interesting because the strategic objective of the Confederacy in the first year or two is to produce a Navy, produce something that is capable of challenging uh, Lincoln's nascent um, blockade by building some uh, uh, ironclad boats that are going to have the ability to uh, go out and break the blockade and open the bays of the Confederacy to international commerce again. And so you see the Confederacy's objective in this first year of the war is to keep the Union Army pinned up down at Fort Monroe while building literally 24-7 at the shipyards, which are commanded by Robert E. Lee's brother, uh, Sidney Smith Lee. And it's interesting because when Lee leaves and goes down and commands down in South Carolina briefly at the start of 62, the, after Port Royal, and he's called back, Lee believes that the real uh, threat is going to be uh, an attack against uh, the shipyard. And he thinks that that's what uh, both Burnside is doing. That Burnside's going to come through the uh, Dismal Swamp Canal, and then McClellan is going to come across uh, from Hampton, and they're going to attack Norfolk. And so Magruder finds that he has a hard time getting support with that. When you look at um, at the movement of the Federal Army, um, how do you feel about? moving the, the army, did, did, did uh, McClellan do a good thing by, by going to Fort Monroe, or do you think that, that he should have um, moved directly against Johnston in Northern Virginia? Well, okay, that, that, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, first off, remember that uh, McClellan's first plan was the uh, Urbana plan. And that's when uh, Johnston and the... Um, majority of the uh, Confederate forces in Virginia were up in the uh, Manassas area, Manassas, Dumfries, Triangle, along that. And the idea was to get behind them, cut them off from Richmond and all that. And then, of course, Johnson, uh, who, who 
<laughs> interestingly, never seemed to be reluctant to give up uh, ground without fighting for it, um, move back and uh, kind of put the sikosh on that plan. So I think the, um, for me, for me personally, I think the, uh, the Peninsula campaign um, emanating out of Fort Monroe was more of a logistics uh, decision and how to support an army as big as McClellan had, especially given the size of the uh, siege train that he planned to bring with him to reduce Confederate defenses. And uh, it, it makes sense. Uh, the one thing I don't understand, uh, and maybe you can talk to this, is I don't understand why the Confederacy didn't move earlier uh, across the uh, Hampton Roads to uh, you know reduce Fort uh, Wool and uh, um, um, uh, Fort Monroe, Fortress Monroe, uh, earlier in the campaign. I mean, they were kind of like they were kind of like sacred places, you know. But it gave such a uh, an incredible advantage, I think, to the Union, um, given their position. And so the Peninsula Campaign, after Urbana was abandoned, uh, makes sense, I think, um, in the aggregate. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, strikes me is the fact that um, if, to this day, you know, I, I can't help but wonder, if you, if you look at the Eastern theater of warfare, there's only two routes, um, operational routes into the North. Uh, one is the Piedmont, you know, Culpeper, Warrington up to that area. And the other, of course, is the Great Valley, the Shenandoah. And Lee was more or less, uh, uh, during his, uh, you know, um, tenure, I guess, as a commander, restricted to um, pretty limited routes by which he could conduct the defensive operation by using offensive operations, what I call defensive offensive operations. And to this day, you know, I just wonder what would, what would have made a difference if the Confederacy had a real no live Navy that could have allowed Lee to move outside of uh, land uh, avenues of approach into the north and maybe, you know, take, take the war to the north from the water. Yeah, it, it's a moot point. They never had that. You know, uh, the Confederacy started with nothing. I mean, really nothing. Uh, and, uh, you know, moved out to try and defend their, their nation. Uh, the other thing that strikes me about Lee, and I think this is something that permeates from obviously June of 1862 to uh, um, the end of the war, is that Lee, as a commander, is working all three levels of war at the same time. He is the advisor uh, to Jefferson Davis which means he's working strategic level, not just in Virginia, but in the Midwest and also Vicksburg and trans Mississippi. So he's got the whole panoply of Confederate forces and uh, missions to accomplish. Uh, second, he's working as a theater, what we call today a theater commander conducting warfare within the theater, in this case, the Eastern Theater, and three, he's also the tactical commander of an army in the field and making the day-to-day -day decisions on movement and maneuver and where they're going to engage and the uh, logistics to make that happen. Uh, something that the uh, North didn't have to worry about. And, you know, and I always think of Meade at Gettysburg. You know, Meade is uh, fighting uh, as a uh, army commander. Uh, all the uh, strategic uh, dimensions are passed to Halleck and Stanton and Lincoln. He doesn't have to worry about that. But Lee 
always has that constant burden, that responsibility that he's trying to balance. Uh, and it, I think it, you know, it shows up in the beginning. Remember when Lee was appointed uh, to command and they said, oh, what are we going to do? We may have to give up Virginia or Richmond. And, and Lee emotionally says, we will not give up Richmond. No, we will not. And, you know, that's kind of a dynamic that just fascinates me, how the man is trying to work the three levels of operational or strategic endeavor at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, because uh, in answer to your question, uh, you wanted to, uh, uh, to know why, why Fort Monroe. I, I think several things that impressed me in my work on the peninsula was that, um, uh, first off, the, uh, the Federals had... Uh, when the, when the uh, shipyard was overrun, uh, they had another gunboat there uh, that was waiting to go into dry dock, but was still afloat. And when the uh, Confederates came in, when the Virginians came in, uh, the Pawnee uh, was able to escape out of the shipyard and, was, and it sailed over and uh, became the, uh, the, the, uh, the water uh, patrol for Fort Monroe. And so uh, with their ability, uh, with, with uh, Monroe sitting on a peninsula, um, uh, the Pawnee became a significant uh, force for them. Now, interestingly enough, and, and I think this is a good point in which to, uh, to raise this, because when you talk about Lee operating on the strategic level, nothing in the world animated the Confederacy more than the realization that Richmond was vulnerable uh, from the water, both uh, the James River, which uh, although it, it, it uh, shoaled uh, just before you got to, uh, to rockets, uh, it was, you could ascend the river and uh, the York River was deep enough with the Pamunkey uh, and the, the Mattapanai coming in at West Point, there was enough there that, um, uh, that it gave great fear to uh, the Confederates, especially after it was rumored in April of 61 that the Pawnee was in fact sailing up the James River uh, and it was going to shell Richmond. Uh, that caused an all hands on deck uh, decision strategically that they were going to take and they were going to pump out as much as they could possibly do with the, um, with the shipyard while they had control of it uh, to try to build a fleet that would control both the James River, the James River Squadron and a York River Squadron. Uh, the original concern was the James River. Uh, it wasn't until they completely armored out the, um, the Merrimack that they realized that they had a bigger problem that the Merrimack was too heavy with the armor on it to pass up the river that uh, it was drafting 18 feet and they had shoaling uh, that was at 15 and 16 feet as you entered the James River. So that's why, that's why Merrimack gets blown up when, when they give up the, the peninsula because even shedding everything they shed, they couldn't get it over the bar uh, up the river. So uh, when when the fight takes place in March of 62, just before McClellan comes down, uh, Lee goes, to, Lee goes to, um, to school immediately on, on the lessons of that. And what he realizes is that, uh, that Merrimack is not gonna be able to control the James River, but it can control the York River because it's York River is deeper. It's deep all the way to West Point. So the Confederacy then from March of 62 up through the time that Johnson evacuates the peninsula, uh, they work assiduously to try to complete the sister ship to the Merrimack, which is the CSS Richmond. And Richmond is going to be an ironclad that's only going to draft 12 or 13 feet. And so the intent is, is to uh, is to complete the Richmond and then have the Richmond and Virginia uh, fight their way through the blockade around Fort Monroe 
and put the Virginia with one or two ships into the York River behind Gloucester Point and have it control along with Yorktown and Gloucester control the deep water access to, uh, to West Point and Richmond. On the James River side, the Richmond, when it's to be completed, uh, it is going to be able to control and steam the, the James River. And so when Johnston comes to the peninsula in April of 62, after McClellan is there, uh, there is a meeting in Richmond between uh, Jeff Davis, Robert E. Lee, George With Randolph, the new Secretary of War, um, uh, Joe Johnston, uh, Gustavus Smith, and James Longstreet. And they meet all day long on the 14th of April. And um, uh, what is imparted to Johnston is that he must hold the Yorktown line, the Warwick River line. Um, Magruder has had one line that he's had to give up, which runs from uh, Harwood Mills over to Lee's Mill, or not Lee's Mill, but rather um, um, Young's Mill. And we'll see that line on this tour. Then his second line is behind the uh, Warwick River, where they dam up the river and we'll get a chance to see uh, the headwaters of the Warwick and the Confederate trench works and all that other stuff that were built for that. That's the line that, that uh, Lee orders Johnson to hold near Yorktown and all the way over to Lee's Mill and Mulberry Island. And then the third line, of course, is the line in front of uh, Williamsburg, which is anchored on Fort Magruder. And that will be kind of the essence of where I focus on because when Johnson comes down, he is very, he, he doesn't want to be there. Ironically, the man who would never take the offensive suggests that rather than send his army to the peninsula, why not send his army north to invade the north? And that will get McClellan off the peninsula. And of course, Davis says, no, that's not acceptable because of Richmond. Of course, what happens um, uh, uh, on the day that McClellan is to open fire to reduce the uh, Confederate fortifications at Yorktown, uh, Johnson withdraws and, um, and pulls out, uh, leaving the shipyard incomplete and unevacuated and basically failing in his main mission, which is why Davis writes, the only thing I regret is the loss of shipyard. But having said that, um, uh, when, uh, when Johnson pulls back up after fighting a rear guard action at Williamsburg, which is beautifully preserved now, a lot of neat place to see there, uh, he pulls back, uh, manages to avoid getting interdicted at, um, at Eltham's Landing and then crosses the Chickahominy, he moves back into the Richmond defenses. And I, I think that um, uh, that's one of the most fascinating um, questions of, of this whole thing is, what was, what was Granny Lee, the king of spades, from your perspective, trying to do in and around Richmond? What, why all this work around Richmond? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, in, in terms of, if you want to look at it in terms of just the uh, principles of war, I think it's a great uh, economy of force operation. I mean, I think, I think Lee, when he uh, took command, uh, understood that he had to very carefully portion his forces to defense offense, if I can use that term. And one of the values uh, traditionally in warfare is that the defense has a three to one value over the offense. That's kind of a loosey goosey thing, but by using, using uh, obstacles, barriers, field fortifications, artillery, 
um, channelization of the enemy's movements, whatever, uh, you can achieve some degree of uh, superiority with inferior forces. And I think Lee understood that. I think Lee was a master of that. Uh, you know, if we, you know, trace his career after that, you know, and, I mean, Chancellorsville to me is a classic case of uh, economy of force and high risk. So um, his view of defending uh, the capital by um, field works. And again, see, here's that transition point. You know, prior to this, field works were kind of, eh, yeah, yeah, a real man doesn't build a wall uh, to fight. And, uh, you know, by the time we get to Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, you know, uh, North Anna, uh, field fortifications are a daily requirement. And, um, but he understands that, you know, by, if I go ahead and fortify the uh, town or Richmond, the city, excuse me, as much as possible, I can free up more forces for offensive operations. And I mean, Lee's view is to take what we call offensive defensive. By taking the offensive, I, I, I get the most out of defensive value um, with my forces. And so even though he takes a lot of hits, you know, Granny Lee, King of Spades, you know, that type of thing, it, it works. I mean, it, it's it, uh, the troops don't get it, but he does. He understands the value. And that frees up a lot of his limited manpower to go to the offensive, uh, you know, to, to drive McClellan away from the gates of Richmond. And I think it's a, I think it's a very effective and well um, conceived strategy, or at least an operational campaign, in one sense, um, to do that. Although he, he he does, he takes a lot of hits. But you know, after the fact, everybody says, "Oh yeah, boy, that worked fine. That was a good that was a good plan." So you know, Lee's. Uh, I think Lee's view of um, operations once he uh, takes command after Johnston is that he understands McClellan uh, and he understands McClellan's operational approach, if you want to call that. And he very, very effectively devises a counter strategy. I, would, I wouldn't call it a campaign because it was pretty much kick the can. Let's see what happens 25 June. Oh, that happened. Okay. Let's see what happens 26 June. Okay. That's what happened. Uh, but as, um, as you pointed out, you know, it was like under normal circumstances or ordinary circumstances, the army of the uh, Potomac would have been destroyed. And I think Lee had the concept he had the conceptual um, approach to it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the guys in charge of the army, what, 24 days, 25 days, and trying to get what is not an army, but just a conglomeration of forces pulled together. Johnson's army, Holmes, Huger, they're all different. You know, the defenses of Richmond, I, you know, I think he does an amazing job. And he was, and, and you know, uh, Lee is able to accomplish in seven days, if you will, what Johnson couldn't do in three months, which is push McClellan back, put him on the river, and relieve the uh, threat to Richmond. I, and, you know, uh, that's an um, that's a seven days piece of it anyway. Um, that's an amazing, amazing military triumph, in my view. Well, you know, I, I think um, I, I, I tend to agree. I think that one of the complaints early on uh, against uh, Lee in command uh, was that his plans were too complicated uh, for people who didn't have the sort of combat experience he had had. Now, uh, combat experience such as it was for Robert E. Lee was as the engineer and as a primary advisor for Winfield Scott in the Mexican campaign from uh, uh, from Veracruz up to Mexico City, and um, 
what he managed to do in terms of creating opportunities for Scott's army uh, is decisive in the in that combat. And and so I think Lee has has a, uh, a sufficient experience that he is able to conceptualize complicated uh, movements of the army. I think the uh, decision to move um, Jackson from the valley, for example, is uh, just extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, gutsy because there's so much dependent on that to move a guy almost 100 miles uh, from one location and make him the uh, the anvil of his of his well, he initially wants him to be the the hammer of his of his action to uh, <clears throat> to turn Porter, and then eventually, I believe he turns Stewart and Jackson into his anvil to ensure that all these hammer blows that his divisions are going to strike at McClellan retreating across the peninsula, down the Charles City Road, down the Williamsburg Road, down the River Road, are all going to result in the enfilade destruction of uh, McClellan's movement. And that the McClellan is just going to be destroyed between the rivers. And so I think that that is phenomenal. One other thing I observed, and you, you, you made a good point, Paul, which I agree, <clears throat> a thing that I was impressed with in the um, French and Indian Wars, uh, the British built uh, uh, fortifications of empire, places like Crown Point and so forth. <clears throat> they were massive fortifications, and they were built for the purposes of, of handling a huge garrison that might eventually be necessary to defend North America. What I found in, in Lee's outer works around Richmond and then the inner works of Richmond was building a capacity to have sufficient fortifications to support a large army in the outer works, but if necessary, to pull back and hold uh, the, the, the capital with lesser troops from the inner works. And so the use of these fortifications, I don't think, as you said, people didn't understand what Lee was trying to do. And I think it is because of these that Lee has the opportunity to flush McClellan. And, and I think that's exactly what he did is I think he flushed um, uh, with Stewart's ride. I think McClellan became extraordinarily uncomfortable with the vulnerability of a supply line. He didn't like the fact that you had to bring stuff from Tunstall, uh, through Tunstall Station, from the various um, uh, ports near White House Landing and at West Point and bring the, the, the supplies to the army some 10 miles in advance. And of course, when we get on that, you and I have talked about going to old church and so forth and following at least a part of Stewart's ride to help people appreciate just how vulnerable McClellan felt he was. And interestingly enough, in less than two weeks time, McClellan is moving everything lock, stock and barrel to the James where it can be supported by gunboats, which he's not being supported by on the York, but he can be supported on the James. And so he makes the decision to go and, and take his folks at the same time that Lee just happens to be turning him. And I think that's one of those, it's almost like um, Longstreet at Chickamauga. You know, Wood, Wood pulls out of the line to go somewhere else to reinforce at exactly the right time for Longstreet. And I think that's what happens with Lee is, is I think McClellan's leaving anyway. What do you think? Well, uh, great thought. You know, uh, for me, again, you know, going back to principles, theories, uh, virtues and all that, I think the uh, two things come up. Uh, 
right away. I think that the um, uh, both the um, Peninsula campaign and then the seven days is a fascinating study on a value of interior lines of operation, exterior lines of operation, and lines of communication. I think that influenced, overly influenced McClellan. I'm not sure. He had to give up uh, White House on the Pamunkey and all that. Um, yeah, the idea of change of base, mm, not sure. I buy that. Uh, you know, I, I, I really think, quite frankly, he got spooked by uh, Stewart's ride around his uh, flank and all that. And he saw his lines of communication um, as being vulnerable. And, and with a heavy siege train, remember, uh, McClellan's big siege train never got off, off the boats. They had to go around to uh, Harrison's Landing, even though, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the lighter, heavier artillery made its way to, to uh, Malvern Hill and then uh, I think uh, under Osborne. No, I don't think Osborne was the uh, commander then, but anyway, uh, the reserve train. Um, it's an it's a incredible study of, uh, you know, Germany's view of lines of operation and lines of communication. The other thing that sticks in my mind, Len, is the fact that I think, I really think Lee understood McClellan and maybe uh, even appreciated his McClellan's experience as an observer in the Crimean War. Remember, uh, McClellan saw the uh, siege operations in the Crimea. And uh, you, you got to sit back and wonder, well, how much did that influence his thinking on the uh, peninsula, you know? And um, ratchet down to the next level of command and division um, you had a bunch of union commanders that were aggressive and smart and uh, had initiative, McCall, Sumner, uh, certainly Fitz John Porter, um, you know, who were looking to, uh, you know, take the, take the fight to the enemy. And McClellan was kind of like, ah, I'm not there yet. You know, uh, we're going to do this uh, like I saw in the uh, Crimea, uh, Crimea, a battle of stages, a battle of advances. Uh, and uh, I always wonder about uh, how much McClellan's opportunity to observe European armies in the Crimea uh, influenced his thinking on the uh, peninsula. I, I mean, I think it's just, I, I, we'll never know. It's a, of, you know, uh, commander's intent and operational approach. Well, you know, the thing that, that uh, interests me about McClellan, uh, and I think there are two things that are, that are important in this instance. I think the first is where McClellan, and you, I, I like to tell people, if you, if you ever played the, uh, the board game Stratego, um, that was a very um, uh, Napoleonic type game in which the objective was to capture the flag and and all the parts and so forth you organize to try to do that. And so you move towards one grand operation and you try to marshal your forces for that uh, one grand effort to, uh, to win the war, to capture the flag. And uh, why in the world McClellan um, had this vision? I mean, he, he had lost three corps, I believe. He had lost... Um, uh, he lost control of McDowell because of Jackson's Valley campaign. Uh, he lost control of um, who is who's the one that joins um, uh, at Gloucester. I want to say it's um, um, it's not Franklin, but he he gains that he gets one core. But when he loses command of all the armies, and he goes to the peninsula with. 90,000 men, they've taken another 
30, 35,000 from him. And he never really seems to get over that. He just, he believes that he can't move when he asks the, the Navy to support him. Uh, the Navy, uh, he, he wants the Navy to move and help him take Yorktown. The Navy says, no, we've got our hands full with the, with the Merrimack. That's our, that's our mission is to keep the Merrimack bottled up. And so McClellan doesn't get the support of the Navy in the York River. And then he just, he finds himself with it raining almost every day. Um, and his belief that his army has been reduced by some 80 or by some 25%, he never feels that he has the forces necessary to actually mount the operation, the one great operation against Richmond. And so I think the, <clears throat> the failure of his, of his intelligence network or, and or his willingness to believe the intelligence reports he got, I think is decisive in this campaign because I don't think his men would have failed to fight well. I think that they were not fought well, if I, if I can make that distinction. Well, it, you know, that's, a, that's a, another great rabbit hole to go down to. My view is I think that McClellan has been wrongly accused of um, inflating numbers. I think that uh, Pinkerton um, gave him, gave McClellan what McClellan, what he, what Pinkerton thought McClellan wanted, but there were a, a lot of indications that McClellan pretty, had a pretty good idea of what the uh, forces arrayed against him were. And of course, re remember, it's, it's interesting to me that the, um, the one division from McDowell, that's McCall's Pennsylvania Reserve show up and they do an incredible job. First at uh, Beaver Dam Creek and then at Glendale. Uh, I mean, they get decimated and of course McCall gets captured. Um, it, 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 it's, it's interesting to me that I think that the idea that McClellan was always, always influenced by Excessive numbers is maybe overblown. I think that um, my my research indicates he had a pretty good idea. Um, you know, plus five, ten percent. I don't know of what he was facing, but that uh, you know Pinkerton just kept fit, feeding him bad numbers that just uh, you know kind of muddied the river. From my point of view. That's just my thought. I mean, you know, there are, you know, you look at the list of folks that are online here. I mean, these guys and gals probably have um, significant uh, perspectives in that respect because that's that's always a big player. Oh yeah, McClellan always thought he was outnumbered. Eh, I don't buy that. I think he had a uh, a good idea of what he was facing, but that like any good commander. I always want more, you know, I need more just to make sure I have, uh, you know, enough guys in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the back street, uh, to move forward if something goes awry, you know, so not sure. Um, that's, you know, I mean, that's part of the fascination, I think of the, uh, for me, the seven days. And the other thing that, that really sticks with me is the uh, initiative and the insight of the uh, commanders, uh, Sumner, Porter, and McCall, Meade, uh, for example. When McClellan left the battlefield on two occasions uh, and just said, okay, you guys are, you know, sorted out and nobody was in charge, uh, they, they did. They figured it out. They did a great job uh, getting out of Gaines Mill. They did a great job getting out of Glendale. And, you know, uh, McClellan's uh, sitting on the river on the Galena, you know, having dinner. And uh, it, it, it just, um, to me, speaks to the uh, uh, insight or intuitive insight and initiative of the commanders 
of the um, Army of the uh, Potomac that he just kind of left to their own devices and they responded. They did great. They did super. I mean, you know, Slocum, uh, Meade, Reynolds, pick one. Um, they, they did what they had to do to save the Army and get it back to, uh, you know, Harris's landing. If you even accept that that's a, a good objective, you know, uh, after they, you know, bailed after Gainesville. Well, you know, it's, it's of interest to me when I look at the, the missed opportunities, when you look at two people, I think, who were, there probably were two people, never two people that were more ill-suited to the responsibilities they were given, to my perspective, than uh, George McClellan and Joe Johnston. I don't think either one of them had the, the extra spark that was necessary to to lead men into battle. And, and uh, I think that the, there was much to be said for their influence, but I also believe that when you look at, uh, you know, in Johnson's case, Johnson is completely out of sync with the needs of his civilian leadership uh, and firmly believes that he knows better in civilian leadership. And lo and behold, what do we see in the correspondence of of George McClellan, we see the exact same thing in which McClellan is is basically um, uh, complaining that uh, if he saves the army, it will be no thanks to the people in Washington. Uh, then he sits down and Lincoln comes down to see him and and he hands him a long list of, of things about what he needs to do if he's gonna win the war. And, you know, I, there's a certain point in which you look at that and you realize that, you know, you got to understand who's the commander and who's not. And if you're a Joe Johnston or if you're a George McClellan and you are not in sync with what the boss wants, I mean, look at, look at McClellan. Um, you know, what I have my thoughts. I'm wondering, what, what did you think about Lincoln appointing his core commanders for him before the campaign? Yeah, well, you, you know, the whole idea of core command is is kind of interesting. You know, that goes back to uh, Napoleon's view of core command. You know, we, we never had corps before that. We always had divisions. And uh, again, you know, I think this is one of Lincoln's um, great perceptives about span of control or today, C2, command and control, that, you know, one man can only control so many entities on a battlefield. And even the Confederacy, you know, in late 1862, went from wings under Longstreet and, uh, you know, Jackson to cause. And, uh, again, and then, you know, you go to uh, Fredericksburg with a, uh, Burnside's grand divisions trying to deal with the business of span of control. We tend to forget, I think, today, that in the uh, 19th century warfare, the means of communication and control are very limited. Uh, there's no radio, there's no walkie talkies, there's a little, little bit of wire with telegraph out to the uh, core headquarters and all that. But, uh, you, you know, my view is what you see on the battlefield is what you can't control. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think McClellan had good, mostly good, I'm not sure about Franklin, uh, core commanders on the battlefield. And I think he gave, had trust and confidence. And that was the essence of command and control but, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, the other side of this, if you look at how Jackson came to the battlefield at Gaines Mill, I mean, it was ugly. It, it, it you know, uh, Whiting uh, came one place, uh, you know, his other, his own division went somewhere else. They kind of showed up between, you know, Harvey Hill and AP Hill and kind of went into battle. And it's a tough business 
uh, controlling large units, especially in the uh, topography that characterizes the peninsula. And, it, you know, quite frankly, it's still the same today. I drive around the battlefields. I get lost. I don't know where the hell I'm going. Uh, you know, what road is this? Was it here then? Was it there? Then? I mean, it's so you got to figure uh, what a tough business command and control is on both sides um, during both campaigns, Peninsula and, uh, uh, you know, seven days. So that, you know, that kind of draws my attention. You know, how do you overcome that uh, kind of lack of uh, awareness of our uh, situational awareness, you know? Well, you know, I, I suspect that both, both Lee and, and McClellan uh, suffered significantly from a, a lack of, of confidence in, in subordinates. I mean, Lee, Lee comes to the battle with uh, uh, six or seven divisions. Um, many, of the, many of the people who are uh, coming to support him, uh, like Theophilus Holmes and so forth, uh, he's got people who are contemporaries uh, who are in the army, people that he's, he's known all of his military life. They're all from the West Point classes of the late 1820s uh, um, and early 30s. And, uh, you know, they, there was a point in which, uh, you know, they exchanged, you know, one was Jeff and the other was, um, was Bobby. And, uh, you know, the, there, there seems to be a problem with that. And I think McClellan's got the same problem with the with the people that Lincoln has appointed um, is that he doesn't necessarily know first he doesn't necessarily want a core structure he wants more control over all the people reporting to him and after it was suggested to him that he form core he comes down with uh, with malaria and uh, doesn't act on it and Lincoln says enough of that and he goes ahead and he appoints uh, um, uh, three or four core commanders that uh, McClellan did not have a say so in they're just put upon him and I suspect for a guy who was upset about not having McDowell and so forth I suspect McClellan was very very resentful of the commander for commander-in-chief of doing that to him yeah yeah, interesting. I mean, I think Lee had the uh, the harder task. He in inherited, he didn't inherit an army. He inherited a bunch of Johnson's troops, came down from Manassas, Holmes' troops, Magruder's troops, Huger's troops. They were all just dis disparate units with different missions. And, you know, I think Lee did, you know, as best he could to try and wield that into some type of uh, um, effective, a powerful army. And, of course, after the seven days, it's interesting to see who gets shit canned out of the army and, you know, and goes somewhere else. You know, I mean, uh, Lee does a very, I think, insightful assessment of like this guy ain't going to work magruder holmes yuga they're gone you know they're 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 you know pack your bags go somewhere else uh train troops uh run the px you know whatever um and but you know for uh, mcclellan the appointment of corps commanders to me is not a big deal because he had competent corps commanders it's just that lincoln was i think trying to help him get his hands around a 105,000 man army and, and reduce the uh, span of control. And it, in, in the aggregate, I think, if you look at it, the core commanders did pretty good. They did pretty well on the battlefield, uh, on their own in many cases. And, you know, that's kind of an interesting study on initiative and, um, uh, Pre-conditioning, uh, you, you know, like you pointed out, going back to the uh, Mexican War and all that, we tend to forget that, you know, prior to the Civil War, there was nothing approaching core, division, brigade, 
maybe battalion operations. It was all companies, you know? There were 16,000, I don't know, what, 400 troops scattered. In the whole army, yeah. Yeah, around the country. And most of them were west of the Mississippi, you know, and and to, you know, to call these guys back in and say, oh, yeah, oh, I want you to command a, 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 a division of uh, 8,000 men. Really? Holy shit. You know, how do I do that? You know? And so it was OJT and uh, in a lot of cases. And, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the casualties plus the um, clinging to Napoleonic tactics in the face of changes in technology was what led to the uh, massive casualties. Just a thought. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a fair point. Um, listen, you know, time has flown as I knew, flown as I knew it would. We're we're uh, knocking on the the front side of nine o'clock. Uh, Warren Breesblad had asked a question uh, that that was focused uh, uh, towards you, and um, uh, that was um, uh, with Lee making the effort to turn McClellan. Conversely, McClellan had the opportunity to just walk into Richmond with a minimal amount of interference. What do you think happened there? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I think uh, McClellan was wedded to his idea of um, advanced by stages and, you know, uh, inflict or uh, um, suffer minimal casualties, you know, and uh, uh, I think that this idea of limited warfare, limited objectives, and just the objective at that time of restoring the union probably influenced his thinking. That's my thought. Okay. Uh, folks, do, we, do, we, uh, do we have time to take some questions or observations? Sure. Or if, we if, have to if, get anybody, off? if anybody would like to... Uh, to ask a question. Uh, anything on, anything a on chat? Them. There's nothing on chat. No, it, we had the couple over there. Okay, Hello, folks. Uh, you want to pipe up? <laughs> I want to hear what you have. Questions, go ahead and ask them on chat. And we'll, um, we'll take those. Uh, otherwise, we'll wrap it up, folks. Oh, man. I wanted to hear from the troops. Okay, you can unmute yourselves if you want to ask a question. Uh, okay, unmute. Okay, great. Let's see what comes up. I've got all night. Oh. Well, I don't, but we'll we'll see what the <laughs> well. Hey, I'm, I'm 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 if you have to go, fine. I'm glad to stay here and engage if the uh, troops uh, want to chat. I don't see anything. Nope, I think it, I think about uh, uh, talked out. So um, we'll go ahead and we'll we'll wrap this up for tonight. And um, folks, I do appreciate you coming out and joining us. And um, if you've got any questions for us and stuff, we'd we'd love to hear from you. And we'll look forward to seeing some of you out there in the field with us in the next month or so. So. Uh, with that, thanks a whole lot. And uh, Paul, thank you. And we'll call it a you night. Bet. Yeah, enjoy the uh, chance to engage. Thank you.